Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Can you guys hear me in here? This is very, this is very sort of European and parliamentary. It's just a, I like it a lot. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Ian. Um, I think you sort of stole my speech. I've actually never had an introduction where someone pointed out the fact that I have sued Arnold Schwarzenegger. And it, it is pretty cool, right? I mean, come on. If you're going to fight for gay equality, do it against uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, the Terminator. Um, so you know, when you asked me to come, it was a, it's a huge honor. Um, I was also very excited to finally come to Ireland. Um, and, and you said to come and please speak about storytelling. And I thought, well, that's really interesting to do that in a law society, uh, in a school that's teaching law, because I do think that the two are so related, storytelling and law, and particularly for not just LGBT people, but for any minority, for any person who is treated differently in a society because they are different, and treated differently specifically under the law. But that, that storytelling has to start personal. It can't start legal. It can't start in a debate. I say this time and time again. You can't really change minds by arguing the truths, by arguing the law, by arguing the facts and the science. Even if you're on the winning side of all that science, the thing that changes hearts and minds is story. So I'll tell you just a little bit about mine and how I got to this place. Uh, mine, my personal story, started with the Mormon church. Does anybody know about the Mormon church in America? It's a very American church. It's been the subject of plays and South Park episodes. Um, yeah, and it's, it's kind of the only church that makes the Catholic church seem really open-minded, right? <laughs> Uh, especially as of late, actually. And that's the church that I grew up in. And growing up in that church, I heard from a very, very early age that homosexuality was sin next to the crime of murder. So from the age of three, four, five, six, when I was just a little kid, three foot tall, I knew that I was right down there with all the sinners and the murderers and the rapists. It was very scary. Uh, and I, and I love my family to death, but I knew that that's how they felt because that's what we had learned. I also grew up in Texas, which is another state uh, that's not quite open-minded all the time about these things. I knew that it was also a crime to be a gay person. It was illegal in the United States when I was a kid to be gay. So I knew that I was a sinner. I knew that I was uh, a criminal. And, and really, somewhere around college, I finally got the courage not to come out, but at least to you know, go out to this little area called West Hollywood. I don't know what the equivalent is here in Dublin, but it's kind of the gay area. And I started to meet some gay people. And I started, I had a crush actually on one, uh, you know, much older gay guy. He was 22 years old and a graduate student. And, uh, and, and I started to fall in love for the first time. And it didn't feel horrible. It didn't feel bad. It actually just started to get scary when I finally got on a plane to go home uh, for Christmas vacation. And, uh, and I was flying home, and I had no clue what I was going to talk about with my family, this family that I loved, because we talked about everything. And then I'll never forget going home and racing home and, and, and seeing my mom at the door greeting me with her open arms and holding me and me wondering if, if this woman who I care so much about, uh, who I'd shared everything with, would actually hold me like that if she knew the truth about me. And I, and I decided in order to avoid all the conversations, I was just going to race upstairs and, and, and go to bed and, and you know, claim exhaustion so that I didn't have to stay after dinner uh, and talk about things that might matter to me. And I did go to bed, and I, I heard within minutes uh, this sort of click clacking sound that I heard my whole life, because my mom was very different herself. My mom was paralyzed uh, from polio, and she walks on, brutches, on, on crutches and with braces on her legs. And, uh, and she was coming down the hallway. And she opens the door to my bedroom. And she comes in. And she sits down in the corner of the bed. And uh, this isn't anything unusual. This is just what we did. We talked endlessly, me and my mom. I just was so afraid. I had no clue what to talk about. So she decided she would set the agenda and just start talking. And she starts talking about this other law in the books in the United States that was called Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Meaning if, if it was found out that you were a gay, lesbian person in the military in the United States, you were kicked out. That was against the rules. And she was military. So stack on Mormon, Texas, growing up in the military, you know, I knew where I stood. And she starts going off about it. She's getting very, very upset about this thing called don't ask, don't tell. And not because it excluded people, but because it was too inclusive. 
right? How dare they let these sinners, these lawbreakers, these broken people into her military that she cared so much about? And I just remember the more I listened to her tell that story and, and to, to share those feelings, those, those hard feelings for me to hear, I just started praying to myself. And I don't pray often, but I was praying to myself not to cry because I didn't want her to know. You know, and, and, it was, and, and the more passionate she got, the harder it got to hold in those tears. And I remember feeling my face get red. And you know that feeling where your eyes start to burn. And before I knew it, that first tear had hit my cheek and that room went silent. And I looked up into her eyes. And this is a good Mormon Southern mom. I mean, she knew. She knew I didn't have to say anything. But loud and clear, what I heard in that silence was that it wasn't okay. That she was afraid for her son. What had she done wrong to break her precious boy? And how could she fix this horrible problem? That's what that silence said. You know, because that's what she'd learned all of those years, growing up the way she did. And I went home. We, we didn't fix it. I flew all the way back to California. And, uh, and my friends were, you know, they could tell something was wrong. And I, and I, and I didn't want to correct them because it was embarrassing, isn't it? To think that your parent who you care about is ashamed of you. And, uh, and so I just said, oh, you know, I'm just nervous. Graduation's coming up. The family's going to be coming out soon and to visit. And they're like, oh, that's fine. They'd met my mom, some of these people along the way. We'll just make, you know, salads and, and pasta and we'll do what we always do. You know, we'll entertain them. And I said, oh, okay. All right. And within a few months, I heard that same sound coming down my hallway. Uh, and this time, my apartment building, that click-clack sound of my mom's braces and crutches coming up the hallway. And, uh, and she comes in. And I'll admit it, I, I absolutely copped out. In that time, I never, ever told my friends how my mom really felt about me and what she knew now. But I absolutely did not tell my mother that so many of my friends now were gay or lesbian. Right? So she comes in and sits down, and I do what I was so good at back then. I just start avoiding the whole situation. I go in and start serving pasta and start serving salads and, and doing all that work. And, uh, and one by one, I start to see my friends come over and start to talk to my mom, which you think is fine until I realize that because I've said absolutely nothing, they all assume that my mom is cool with gay people. Right? So they start telling her about their stories. And let me, let me clarify this. This is before in America Ellen had come out on television or there was a show Will and Grace. Like this was way before it was OK to be gay in popular culture. So she was like a goddamn saint to them. So they're like sharing and sharing their stories of them coming out to their families and not being able to go home for Christmas at all. They're coming out stories where they're rejected by family or their fear of ever telling family. My mom is listening so well, and, and a good Southern American mom can really listen. They just sit there and nod, like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and they don't know any better. These are mostly California kids, so they're like, oh, wow, she's really digging this. So they get further and further into it and start talking about their dating lives with my good Mormon Southern mother. And then finally, their sex lives with my good Mormon <laughs> Southern mother. And I'm freaking out, right? So I'm backing up into the kitchen, going, going, holy cow, what's going to happen here? And all of a sudden, within you know, the hour, everybody's gone. My roommate has headed to his room because he knows what's coming. Uh, and, and, and so it's just me and my mom left. And she pats the chair uh, next to her. It was this old futon couch we had in college. And she says, come sit down. And I remember coming and sitting down next to her. And uh, she said, well, I met your friends. <laughs> I said, yeah, yes. Uh, she's like, well, I met one in particular. Um, he's a 22-year-old graduate student. And I was like, yes, uh, I know the one that you mean. And she says, well, we had a long talk. And you know, he's OK. But uh, I told him that. Uh, he ought to start treating you a, a little bit better. And the next time he takes you out, I think he ought to pay. <laughs> and she just looked me right in the eyes. And she opened up her arms. And she wrapped them around me. And she held me so incredibly tight. And it was the first time in my life that I knew, I absolutely with clarity knew, that my mother loved me for me. 
absolutely for me, for who I am, even the gay part. And how did that happen? How did that change happen? It didn't happen because my friends went out there and preached about all the facts about being gay, about the science about being gay, about why politically it's right for minorities to be protected. It's because they shared their personal stories. Their own personal stories were able to change my mother's heart in one night. Everything that she had learned from the church, everything that she had learned from the government was gone in one night. And that's the power of personal storytelling. I learned it right then, I learned it right there, and I said, if this is the power of personal storytelling, this is what I'm gonna do with my life. You know, so if it was uh, my poor agents once I graduated from college, if it was a reality show, it was the gay-themed reality show, if it was a mini-series, it was on Pedro Zamora and the AIDS crisis in the 90s, and within 10 years I got to tell the story of my great hero, Harvey Milk, and bring it to screen. And I thought, this is the change that needs to happen, not just for gay and lesbian people, but for all minorities, is to be able to tell our stories to create that kind of change. And, I, and, I, and when I got the invitation from you to come here, I thought, boy, you guys are on really the cusp of change here in this country. You know, you have this referendum coming up in just a few months now. Is it, they set the date as May 22nd, right? You know, and I have mixed feelings about rights being put up for a vote, minority rights. You know, the basic structure of a democracy, the cornerstone of a democracy, is the protection of the minority from the tyranny of the majority meaning that popular vote. And as you've watched marriage equality spread across the world, one of the things we've learned is that this isn't a right that should be put up for a vote. This is a fundamental right that is bigger than any one belief system, bigger than any one religion. It is a fundamental right of being a human being to marry the person that you love that should defy race. It should defy religion. It should divide, uh, defy how much money you make and absolutely shouldn't be held against you because of who you love. And so, you know, I, as much as it's hard for me to see it put up for vote, I'm, I'm happy that it is. You know, as much as it scares me because I watched our rights in California. In California, we have a constitution that's a little bit older than yours, but it's subject to the same whims because a minority vote can change it. And we watched in Proposition 8. Does everyone know what Proposition 8 was in California? In Proposition 8, it was a constitutional amendment. And these groups came in, these small groups with a lot of money, the Mormon church included, and they started telling lies. And they started spending so much money on campaigns like Save the Children from Homosexuality, saying that somehow gay and lesbian children, just gay and lesbian people, somehow hurt children. Just that children even knew about gay and lesbian people somehow was going to hurt children, despite all the science, despite all the findings, they had the money to push the message out there, and sadly, they won. You know, and I already hear campaigns here in Ireland that are sounding similar. One of them called the Sounds of Sodomy. <laughs> I mean, what is that campaign commercial going to look like and frankly sound like? <laughs> you know, what are they talking about? I, I saw some of this campaign literature already and it's so infuriating because they're using some of the same arguments that we've heard for generations against gay and lesbian people that we shouldn't be able to marry because we can't procreate. You know, I mean, that's one of the arguments that says to me loud and clear, take this to a court of law. Take this to a court of law. Because in the United States, what we did when we lost, and this is why I'm so happy to be among law students right now, when we lost, me and a group of people in California said, how are we going to defeat this Proposition 8? How are we going to defeat these lies? And me and a group of people and two of the best lawyers in the United States, one who was very conservative, one who was very liberal, opposite ends of the spectrum politically, came together and said, we are going to tell our personal stories, but we're going to do it in a venue where they can't lie anymore. And that is a court of law where in the United States you have to raise your right hand and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And one after the next, we saw their arguments fall. Procreation, give me a break. What kind of Orwellian laws will you put in place to enforce that? Must everybody, right, ha have a test to see if they're fertile before they get married? <laughs> you know, what's that going to look like? Older people who fall in love again after they've lost a spouse, are they also banned from marriage? You know, and, and we were able to bring up in a court of law the science of raising children. And their one opponent 
to marriage equality who was brave enough, frankly, to come in and raise his right hand and tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but, who had said the whole time that straight parents somehow would make better parents than gay parents, had to admit under oath that that was a lie, that it wasn't true, and that the science, in fact, said that gay and lesbian parents often outstrip heterosexual parents. And you know why? Well, one is we don't have accidental births in the gay and lesbian community, now do. <laughs> we want our children. And that often we outstrip heterosexual parents when it comes to child rearing because of that. When you're looking at the statistics in a court of law, and we have so many law students here, you can tell personal stories, you can dispel myths, you can dispel lies. And you can bring more freedom to people, and not just LGBT people, but all people who are treated differently under the law because they are different. And I'll get to one last thing, because I don't want to disparage what's going to happen here on May 22nd. As much as I wish it was a court of law that was doing it, so that those decisions wouldn't be left up to the whim of a, of a majority vote in the future, it still says something so beautiful about the Irish people. That when you win on May 22nd, it says that you understand the value of diversity. So much so that Irish people so much understand the value of diversity that you actually showed up to vote for it. That you know that it doesn't just benefit gay and lesbian people, that a society benefits from multiple points of view on a problem, right? One kind of person looking at a problem doesn't solve it. You want a better Ireland? Have a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds who are raised different, who look different, who believe differently, looking at the same problem, and you will be the greatest nation on the earth. And you have the chance to make that statement on May 22nd. And here, you people who are learning how to tell stories and understand law, you have the power to go out there right now and change minds and motivate people to show up to the polls on May 22nd. And you do it with your own personal stories. For the LGBT people in here, go out and come out and tell your stories of why this matters, that people show up. And for people who aren't LGBT, let's be clear. You are all minorities in this room in one way or another. It just depends on how you slice the pie, where you're from, how much money you make, what you believe. These are all ways in which you are different, and they're all ways that make you beautiful. And in sharing your difference and how you feel it is valuable to Ireland, you will urge people to go out and protect this minority, the LGBT minority, on May 22nd. So I urge you to take a piece of yourself and to build a bridge, and to build a bridge for a more equal Ireland on May 22nd. Thank you so much for having me here. It's a great honor.